Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome back to the Theocracy Podcast. My guest today is Keith Darrell. I met him about a year ago. Somebody organized some post-church Sunday pizza. meeting at a pizza place. Yeah, at Slice. And uh, uh, heard a little bit about what he does as a campus preacher. Yeah, I think I just got punched. Right, uh, I guess it was actually it was a year before. Because uh, uh, I remember telling that story there with the Sean. Sean was there. Uh -huh. And uh, so I do remember talking about that a little bit. So Yeah, so... There was that. And then somebody recently told me he heard your story about like how you would gather crowds and stuff. Okay. I don't know if you want to maybe start with that and then we can sort of back up and okay. and go. Yeah. So, well, uh, yeah, I'm Keith Darrell. I do open air preaching on college campuses, uh, usually Monday through Friday while school's in session. And I'm usually traveling all around the United States. Uh, I just got back from the Southeast. I was in Florida preaching for the last month, as well as Alabama, Tennessee. And then I race back here to be here for a week. Uh, but yeah, ba basically what I do is uh, I guess the basic vision would be if you've read Acts chapter 17, Paul's in Athens, his spirits provoke because the city's filled with idolatry. So he goes in the synagogue in the marketplace and begins to basically reason with those who have been there. So I show up to a college campus, uh, usually go to either the library or the student union. If I've never been to a campus before, there's usually two main spots I'll go to and just kind of see what traffic's like, see if there's a place where people can gather. Um, because it is, it's kind of like running a business. You need a location. You know what I mean? So every now and then the school will be like, yeah, you can say whatever you want. Go on the backside of that dumpster. You know what I mean? So you're just kind of like, well, that's not gonna, it's not gonna really help my cause. So um, what I normally do is I'll read Psalm chapter 24 or just, because literally your first minute doesn't matter because there's nobody there you know what i mean like or right. there might be a few stragglers coming out of a building and you just kind of have that vibe where it's like okay people are starting to leave a building we're going to have a change over here and it's during that changeover is the main part that you want to really start preaching and try to get people in so uh you know i'm nervous every day and so you just need to get the first couple words out and once they're out then you're kind of like okay it's just a conversation at that point you know what i mean it's kind of like talk to a girl the first time you're like oh nervous and you start talking like all right we're fine so, but so i'm a little bit nervous every day just because you're kind of like yeah can i get a crowd uh because you do kind of feel like you're naked in public if you don't get a crowd and mm -hmm. to have like an 18 year old tell you to go get a real job you know what i mean <laughs> get a real job loser you know it's always what a loser i am so Read through Psalm 24, which begins, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell therein. And I'll read through the whole thing, and but then I'll usually double back to that. And the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell therein. So whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're male, female, straight, gay, confused, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell therein. And I'll say something to the effect of like, you don't owe your allegiance to your country, you don't owe your allegiance to your race, you don't owe your allegiance to whatever uh, your your sex, your gender, your social economic standing, but you owe your allegiance to the Lord. And then uh, usually at some point uh, therein, someone will drop an F-bomb on me and then this crowd starts to gather. And then then from there, it's uh, basically like an open line. Like if you ever listen to Rush Limbaugh, you used to have this thing, Open Line Fridays, where people could call in and talk about whatever they want to talk about. And it's basically Open Line Friday the rest of the day. And I'm always trying to bring it back to the gospel. So we'll talk about sex. We'll talk about economics. We'll talk whatever about people want to bring up. Yeah. So And Jesus is Lord of everything. So we'll talk about everything. So that's basic, basically it. Most days, um, yeah, I would say nine out of 10 times, we maybe even more than that, nine, 98% of the time, probably get a crowd. I feel like maybe twice a semester, you have like a legitimate whiff uh, where you just can't buy a crowd. You know, and obviously some days, I usually describe it as a bell-shaped curve. You have your days that are tens where literally the police are like, hey, will you shut it down? Because like people are throwing stuff at me or stealing my stuff and all that sort of jazz. Um, or and then you have your zeros. And you know, the 10 and the zero are the outliers. Um, but most days are like a four to the five. You have 50 to 100 kids gathered. And um, yeah, you have some energy and some pop and some pepper. And you kind of go back and forth from around noon. I usually start around 11.45 and I go till... Really, nobody wants to listen anymore. Most days, it's around 5 o'clock, 5.30. Um, and you kind of have a rotating crowd the whole time. So people will be, you know, they, they'll come out for lunch, grab their lunch, sit there for an hour, go leave, new changeover. People see a crowd. Then you just kind of have, it's kind of self-sustaining after. It's kind of weird. It's, it's, it's fun to be a part of. Cause like, you are, you're looking at this thing going like, yeah, like, no one's coming or going. And there are certain days like no one's coming or going. Oh, now we got a whole new whole new rotation. So a lot of your material is recycled um, mm -hmm. because you got a lot of the same questions and stuff like that. But that's the that's the basic gist of how the day kind of operates. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people listening are wondering just how, like how do you get up the gumption to even start that and what, what would possess somebody to start that? So if you want to back up and like start me from the beginning, like what was your testimony? How did you come to faith and how did you find out this is your niche? Yeah, I grew up in a very liberal Episcopal church. Um, but I always believed in Jesus. I remember my parents having 
a little grumpy kid on the refrigerator that says, I know I'm somebody because God don't make no junk. And uh, and I do remember being like, yeah, I've been made by God ever since like I can remember. You know what I mean? Like, it was just like a self-evident truth. Like, yep, I've been made by God. And then I remember like third grade laying in, uh, in my backyard, looking up at the stars when I was little and just being like, yeah, there's a God. And coming in from recess in the third grade as well, had very vivid thoughts that God knew everything. And at the time, I'm sure it was just my math. I was maybe wrestling with how you round numbers and stuff like that. And I remember just thinking like, God knows how to do that. You know what I mean? And so it was just like, so I just have like these little epiphanies of like, yep, there's a God. We should worship him, love him. Um, sixth grade, the good thing about the Episcopal Church, I had to go through confirmation. So I learned the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. I had to have those things memorized to go through confirmation. So on the These two scripture passages, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. At least the Ten Commandments and then the Lord's Prayer. So most nights before I went to bed, I'd say the Lord's Prayer. Um, and then... You know, junior high, sin kind of sprang to life to me, and I kind of like suppressed. I would still pray many days, but uh, as far as trying to obey God or anything like that, there was very little uh, obedience in my life. It was more, yeah, just selfishness and rebellion. And starting freshman year of high school, kind of got tired of getting in trouble. I, like if uh, something would happen, my name would get, you know, I'd get sent down to the office. I'd be like, I didn't do anything. And they're like, sure, you didn't do anything. That's a good and, motivation. <laughs> yeah. Tired of getting in trouble. Yeah, I was tired of getting in trouble. And uh, so I started going to a thing called Young Life, uh, which is like a high school uh, camp, like high school ministry sort of thing. And the best thing about Young Life is they got me reading the Bible. They gave me a Bible. Um, they gave me a booklet called My First 30 Quiet Times, which were basically like, you know, has like a scripture passage you look up, then it has like a little talk about it or whatever and it was only like maybe like a page or two and um so i started reading the bible more starting in high school and the two things that kind of two verses got etched in my head philippians 121 for me to live as christ and die as gain and i remember just like i loved philippians when i was like oftentimes reading my sophomore year maybe once a week i just read philippians because i was like man like something about everything you know, he'd say there he kind of everything dung you know what i mean like this sort of stuff i was like i was just in if, if i i was drawn to people who were all in and i felt like a philippians was a book that was all in he's to die is gain. I'm counting everything dung. So I really like that. One of the other passages I memorized was 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your anxieties on the Christ because he cares for you. So, um, you know, kind of living a normal, I thought I was a Christian, living a normal life, doing sinful things. Um, halfway through my senior year of high school, there's basically two events. I had a friend commit suicide and there was a growth of immorality in my life. And when my friend committed suicide, I was like, I'm going to be a good person. And the more I devoted myself to being good, I'm like, I ain't good. You know what I mean? Like, and it was, it was all the things that like, I feel like we take for granted or like, we just think uh, like, for example, I couldn't do the dishes without grumbling. And I remember thinking like a good person should be able to clean dishes without complaining to his parents. You know, a good person should be able to clean his room without complaining. Like, so it was all these things that like, I think we don't necessarily inherently think are sinful, but I just thought a good person should have no problem doing all these things. And I was dating this girl and the way you roll your eyes, turn your shoulder, don't take your phone call. I'm though you're rejecting them. All those things just became explosively sinful to me. So I started it's not necessarily explicit, but it's all just the attitude. Yeah. It was just a total attitude. We're just like, yeah. And you just felt like if, if I'm really trying to be, if uh, you just felt like a good person would ooze good, you know what I mean? A, a good treat, but there's good fruit. I'm like, this is, it's really hard to bear any fruit here. So I must not be a good tree. And, uh, and so I started doing transcendental meditation I just went to the library. I was checking out books on Islam, transcendental meditation, and some Christian stuff. And Jesus was always a guru in the mix. So if I was reading transcendental meditation, he was an enlightened one. He could lead me to enlightenment. He was a prophet in Islam. So uh, so I couldn't escape Jesus. That was one of the things you're just kind of like, yeah, like whether he's the son of God, I don't know, whether he's a prophet, whether he's a guru. And I had some weird experiences doing transcendental meditation. And, you know, if I was and, you know, I don't think I'm going to apostatize, but if I was to apostatize, I'd, I'd probably go Eastern because like, I had these weird experiences and you're just like and it was amazingly peaceful you know what i mean so it sounds like sound like a nut saying that but that's what it was so i can see why people are like oh no when i do these things i amazing i have this transcendent peace because i experienced some of that doing it um but it was also there, there are a couple things that stopped me from going too deeply into it but it was like one of them was i just liked my life uh and i remember but i remember thinking like if everyone would just do this if the whole world would do this at once we'd have this harmonic convergence and we'd all be one and it was this bizarre metaphysic that i thought we'd all melt into one and kind of become one and all that sort of jazz so um and islam for whatever reason just didn't really appeal to me um i think it was maybe more of a cultural thing uh so it was uh, christianity or some sort of eastern thing and uh got in a fight with my girlfriend punched the windshield 
And when I punched the windshield, that was like the first that like anger was like deep with like a guttural response. Like Paul, I didn't have the language of the flesh, but I just felt like, man, that came from like my bowels. You know what I mean? So, and that's, uh, and uh, again, a good person would not have anger coming from deep within them. And then you tell people that story and like, oh, you're a good kid. You're just, you know, just, uh, you have a good heart, but everybody does that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody does that. And it was always, you have a good heart. You just, I was like, that's, I think that's the problem. I don't have a good heart. You know, uh, I'm, you, we haven't touched the iceberg. And so anyway, first Peter five, seven went home. I remember putting the keys on the table say, mom, dad, I'm going to bed. Um, I broke the windshield. I just went upstairs, prayed through first Peter five, seven said, Jesus, if you're Lord, I'm going to, I'll serve you. I'll obey you. And I would say at that point, it's kind of like, uh, was it Pilgrim's progress when the burden was lifted? I was just like, I was suddenly free. I remember going to bed real easy for the next eight hours. And I remember waking up the next day and it was like, you know, existentially, it was kind of like the sun was brighter. The birds were chirping. Like uh, it's almost like a Disney movie when the uh, curtains close, it's kind of dark and it opens back up. It's like tweet, tweet, tweet. And it was like, I'm in a new world. I'm a new creature. Um, so I was in August of 93. So I've been serving the Lord almost 30 years now. And he's been faithful to me, even if I've wanted to rebel or anything like that, he's chastised me and brought me back. Um, and I went off to college a month later, knowing nothing. And I saw a guy preaching and that was my introduction to open air preaching. I remember crossing the student union and seeing like a hundred kids going nuts. Um, and, and then the more, uh, yeah. So I remember seeing that and I'm by nature, maybe contrarian. So everyone's like, stay away from the guy who preached at the union. So I'm like, I gotta go check out the guy. <laughs> That's a union. You know what I mean? Like if everybody can't stand this guy, there's gotta be something, uh, right about him. I, that was my, and he was a Pelagian and he had a lot of heretical issues that I just was not aware of. But the thing that drew me to it was a friend of mine lived in the honors dorm and you had, uh, in there, like a guy who was a socialist, you had a guy who called himself DM for demon master. He thought he can conjure and control demons. You had another person who slept in a coffin. You had a girl out there with tarot cards. And so like, you're kind of like something spiritual is going on out here. You know what I mean? We can say, stay away from that guy, but he shows up and you have all the spiritual conflict, this immediate spiritual conflict. And that, that was like interesting to me and I didn't know enough. So I went home and I read the book of Acts. And I was like, Oh, this is what's going on in Acts. Like this, this is the sort of stuff we see here. People so, burning their books from conversions yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah, and there's rioting and there's people being beaten. There's argument. And there's tension. You exercised my medium from her spirit. And now she can't prophesy and give people's futures and stuff anymore. So when we're out of we're out of the revenue from that. <laughs> yeah, we're losing our money. So you know, guys got to get out of here. Yeah, and so um, yeah, that was and that was it. I remember reading. Acts and being like, why has everybody been out of shape? This guy open air preaching like this is fairly normal in the Bible. Jesus is publicly preaching. The prophets are publicly preaching. The apostles that was involved with Campus Crusade for Christ and we're reading a book. I think it was called like Fire Seeds of Spiritual Awakening or something like that. And a lot of it was discussing Wesley and Whitfield and these men down through history are publicly preaching. And so I just realized it was pretty normal. Um and that was the draw it was like, this is normal. It's not just like a guy going rogue and doing his own thing. And just like, uh, you know, I think some people do do that in open air preaching. Um, but that was kind of the introduction to it. And so I wanted to do it for a long time. And finally in 2000, I was in seminary and some guys approached me and they're like, Hey, we have some money. Uh, you've talked about doing this for a long time. If you want to come under us and, you know, take some time off of seminary and preach, give it a shot. And so I took a semester off, lived out of a Volkswagen bus for 15 weeks and, uh, the fall of 2000 and uh, fell in love with it. Uh, but yeah, the first day it took me about an hour and a half to say anything. Cause I remember just being like, Oh, we're out there and start preaching. I remember getting out there and be like, oh, I'm so scared. <laughs> you know I mean? I'm so scared. And it was, it was an hour and a half, then maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And now it's kind of like, okay, I can just roll out there and start talking. Cause yeah, worse comes to worse. Like, yeah, you're mild. It's mildly embarrassing. The you know, public speaking is often difficult. Um, it's the number one fear above death. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, that's a, that's what I, I hear that I hear that quite a bit. So you have that element, um, but yeah, once you get a crowd going, but then and then you you have temptations where like if you're preaching with somebody else, one of the hard parts actually is the baton pass. So if say I preach for an hour, I tag my buddy in, or my buddy preaches for an hour, he gets a crowd going, tags me in. It's almost like you get like a new pastor in a church, and oftentimes people will leave when you have a new pastor. So sometimes it is gutting, like you get tagged in. Next thing you know, like everybody's gone. You know what I mean? Cause like you just kind of, and at this point it it's worth a shot. Yeah. It's worth a shot. But at this point that doesn't really happen. Like you start to learn like transition points and like how to immediately draw people into you and stuff like that. But 
um yeah that, but it is one of the hard parts is like yeah just stand there like in public like you feel like an idiot and people don't care and uh you know they yell at you like nobody cares like yeah i can tell i can see that and uh so that you know and, but once you overcome that and it's just like an element of death to self you know what i mean like all right i have to die to the pride that i'm something and it's uncomfortable doesn't... but the other side is worth it after yeah. you know what i'm gonna get on the other side yeah and once you get the interactions going too like it's amazing like the people who sit out there for, like literally for five hours and six hours and uh many people who i still keep in touch with and even like it's almost like they're not getting that in their lectures and their classes <laughs> yeah yeah i know they're like yeah they, they can't wait to leave their being class told what to think instead of being allowed to discuss and wrestle with ideas yeah and just debate through things and it's amazing that they'll be out there for so long and even i've gotten twice in the past few weeks have interacted with people who listen to me 18 19 and uh, have messed me years later and be like hey in the last six months i became a believer or something like that and so and i'm what you know one man sows when water god gives the increase and so there's been plenty of people between those two points but even like that sort of thing you see the fruit of it as well, which is often encouraging. And even a couple of weeks ago, I was down in Florida preaching and a young guy from Venezuela, actually, uh, he heard me taking on the communists. And so he was sitting there listening for a while. Then I finished up the day and he comes up and talked to me and we're talking. He's like, where do you think uh, evil comes from? And I wasn't really getting his question. Finally, he, he said, um, one thing that's good about me is I can talk to women. One really bad thing about me is I can talk to women. He's like, I, and he's like, well, so I, I don't know what's wrong. I, I, I can't remain faithful. I keep lying. And he's like, where does that come from? Where does that come from? And that's what he was getting at was where does sin come from? Like, he, cause he was dealing with his own issues. So I took on the Romans seven fifteen, which is something to the effect of like, you know, why is it that I can't do the things I want to do and the very things I want to do mm -hmm. since I can't do, I hate doing the things I do. And, right. and that's kind of where he was. So I, I took him that passage and he just stopped when he read it. He was like, that's it. That's it. And he read the rest of the thing. He took a picture of it and um, blah, blah, blah. But, and so like to even have those interactions on a pretty almost daily basis with someone along those lines, just like, it's, it's easy thing. It, in another way, it's like, it's an easy thing to do. You know what I mean? Like, um, and that's even like broadly, if you know, anybody listens, to this, like do evangelize, like people, yeah, people are going to, reject you in many ways, but you're going to find those people that genuinely want to listen. You're just like, man, that's so worth it. And once you have like a little bit of success, it is almost like addicting. Like you're kind of like, I got to tell people about Jesus. And like this person knew nothing an hour ago and they at least know the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus. You know what I mean? Like they, they know the basics right now. And yeah, it's pretty exciting to be a part of that. And, and even when I'm preaching, and this is kind of like a funny story. This is, I think it was 18 or 19. I was preaching in Washington and I remember the, I had a pretty good crowd. There was a hill and I don't know if you're, if your crowd is charismatic. I don't want to. I don't want to like throw you off. Possibly somewhere. not that I know of that have reached out to me at least. Uh, okay, um, because like because there are times like I'll just say like you. Almost, it's almost like I, I'll just say that I think the spirit gives me eyes to see. And you can see people literally getting hardened or softened to the gospel. And there are times where I'm like you can look out over the crowd and just the vibe of the whole thing. You're like believer, believer, not a believer, stuff like that. And I remember preaching and there's this kid sitting on a hill, and I was like, oh, that guy's a believer. He just loves this and blah blah blah. And a semester later, I come back. And he walks up to me with another guy and he's like, hey, um, I listened to you last semester. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember you're sitting on the hill. He's like, yeah, I became a believer that day. I was like, are you serious? You weren't already a believer? He's like, no, I just knew everything you were saying was true. I just knew it was true. And uh, and like I remember looking at him on the hill and being like, oh, yeah, he's a believer. He agrees with me. But it was just the spirit opening his eyes to it. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's one of the things being a part of that is like – wild like the wind blows where it wills i can't control that you know what i mean like i can't make anybody out there a believer but it's it seems amazing that i can stand out there and hoot and holler about jesus for five hours or whatever and lord is eternally changing people um through that it's pretty wild yeah and then as well as all the the cases of success that you don't know about mm -hmm. well i shouldn't say success because even turning certain people off to the gospel i'd say that's success because it's a, sort of a winnowing of the the seed and the chaff yeah so yeah paul says everywhere we go we spread the aroma of christ some are the aroma of life others are the aroma of death so if you know from the aroma of death it's still successful but yeah hearing fruit like positive fruit people are converted and that and that's usually actually most of the fruit that i'm a part of is more indirect. I preach on campus. Some kid goes back to his dorm and starts asking questions, yeah. Googling things, mm -hmm. looking up different churches in the area or somebody else has been uh, another believer on campus has been trying to talk to him about something. And now they get into a group discussion. Yeah. Or and six months later they become a believer or something like that. So it's, it's just part of that process. And, um, yeah, that's, the thing. it's kind of interesting that the, the aspect of, uh, yeah, where, where people start to Google, uh, Google me. Like I remember a couple years ago at, uh, I was preaching at Cal state Fullerton and a, a guy comes up. I thought he wanted to shake my hand. I go to put my hand out to shake his hand and he just starts tearing into me. F you, you're a piece of boo, boo, boo. And just, uh, and, and it was kind of funny cause there was a young, 
Asian man sitting next to me who's a Christian. And uh, as he started calling me like a piece of crap and all that sort of stuff, I started saying, uh, well, I started nettling him a little bit. I was like, well, uh, I was like, well, the irony is you're the one calling me a piece of crap. You, I don't think I'm better than you, but I assume you think you're better than a piece of crap. So I'm kind of nettling him a little bit as he's like tearing into me. And he's like, you shut your mouth and blah, 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 going on, 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 on. And, uh, and then he leaves and the young Asian man next to me goes, why would you, why would you push him so hard? I was like, he'll be back. Don't worry about it. He'll be back. And sure enough, a week later, he's like, uh, he came up to me. He's like, man, I want to apologize about last week. I, I was so mad when I saw you. He's like, but I went home. I Googled you. I read about George Whitfield because uh, I'm part of a thing called Whitfield Fellowship. I read about George Whitfield feel what about your life and blah, blah blah and like he spent previous week learning tons of information uh all because i was pushing him you know what i mean like like he comes up a house of fire and and that's one of the things like it's maybe hard because like you, i don't want to encourage people to just go pushing people's buttons there because there, there's, there's it's like it's like being a coach like I, I, there's a practical aspect like you know some guys come off the field you ground by the mask and you yell at them others you just put your arm around them I mean, and and it's a wisdom decision and subjective and so i don't want to like encourage people just go nettle any guy coming up but oftentimes the guy who's most hot with me i'm comfortable nettling because i was like no they'll be back I, I i see it all the time the, the person who's most upset with me and even uh, actually, a guy at church the other day was like, I used to argue with you in 18 and four months ago, I became a believer, but he was always giving me the business in 18. And I was like, yeah, no, that's why I'm out there. Cause people like you, I know, I know the, the person who's most upset with me with the cuss words, the middle finger, that's much better than the person who's just ignoring me because that person, you know, seems to be seven out of 10 times is genuinely engaged with what's going on. So. Mm. Yeah. And it seems, I think that's probably a primary way that people neglect to build trust is when somebody starts calling you names and then you don't call them names back you say i'm no better than than you are mm -hmm. and it's like whoa wait a minute this guy's not defending himself at all yeah, so yeah. <laughs> that somehow is like a better defense <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Believe, believe me guys I, i'm worse than what you're gonna throw at me you know what i mean i, I know it was in my heart you know what i mean I, so so what you guys are throwing at me is minimal compared to uh the reality of who i am so so uh, one question that i have for you um because my gut reaction it, when i see anybody doing something that i think is good is also is there is there um another way to achieve the same result as well because you don't want to just necessarily put all your eggs in one basket and one thing that i that came to my mind was the difference between um evidentialism versus presuppositionalism mm -hmm. in how you witness to people do will you go back and forth and how you deal with people depending on where they're at yeah i'm a total pragmatist on apologetics so what what you want is kind of like you want to be a doctor who has a bunch of different tools like if you just you know without putting everybody down if, if 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 all you do is just ask by what standard every time like you might feel like you shut their mouth or something like that but they're leaving they're going it doesn't make sense to most people. yeah yeah and so it's just like you're what all right and they leave and you may have got someone worked up and there may be one person who understood it but the reality of it is um i think everybody is a realist to some extent they know there's a real world they know there's real history and i've jesus would say like if you don't believe on account of what i'm telling you I believe on account of the things that i do yeah exactly and so uh, oftentimes I've found like the historical argument for the resurrection makes the most sense. You know what I mean? Like to, uh, just, it's a, it's a direct argument to people um, and just kind of emphasizing that. And, and even within that, you get to preach the gospel in, in the, in the context, the gospel is not Christianity's is a necessary precondition for knowledge. And I I'm broadly subscribed to strands of presuppositionalism, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. And, you know, you don't have to spend tons of time on epistemology. Most people are not thinking about epistemology. And and the fact that you have like three words of epistemology that no one else knows, you're always going to be able to grandstand on a college campus. You know what I mean? Like, um, but how do you actually preach the gospel and do apologetics in the gospel? So I'm very much a pragmatist um, when it comes to evangelism. Um, and I've broadly found that what makes the most sense and even just bears fruits, I think it's preaching the gospel. And that's even that, that, that subtle irony is preaching the death of my resurrection of Christ, since that's the gospel, that's the power of God and salvation. When you're doing that, you, I, yeah, I just broadly will say that's the most uh, fruitful thing. And even, even like so many issues um, without being an obscurantist on things. So when I'm out there, say abortion comes up, I'll just say, uh, I don't spend tons of time on abortion because if you are not worshiping the living God, you're serving death. And so the idea that you guys would kill your children is not surprising to me. Um, but, if you come to worship God through the resurrection of Christ and you understand uh, the life in his resurrection, it's going to change your view of sexuality. It's going to change your view of sex. It's going to change your view of uh, the baby growing in your belly. All those things need to change. So the, the, that's, I don't spend tons of time on these things because the main issue is worship. So in one sense, I'm still rebuking it, still calling it sin, still identifying as sin, but recognizing 
maybe this is a pre-sub saying, recognize that like barring their change in worship, nothing's going to change. You know what I mean? I'm not out there to make a bunch of pro-lifers, um, although a fruit of Christianity is you're a pro-lifer. You know what I mean? And so the, the main issue is worshiping Yahweh. And so how do we that that's the main issue that i'm out there all day long the issue out here today is worship are you gay yeah of course you're confused on where your penis goes like you don't worship god you don't know what it means to be a man you don't know what it means to be a woman like here's what it means to be a man here's what it means to be a woman and it begins by worshiping god and then from there since he's lord he gets to tell you what to do with your body and so you got to do two things even in do, bringing in strands of that is you're rebuking sin like of course you're utterly confused you're in darkness um and the way out of that is worship and so i even even that i just feel like is you're preaching a gospel to him there's good news like you are in chaos you are in slavery uh, the good news is you can escape it through worshiping god through the death of and resurrection of christ so hopefully that answers your question but yeah that's what i'm always trying to bring it back to like no matter what is what we're talking about the death and resurrection of jesus christ is the the remedy to everything like that that and that's our heart whole hope um is that and so that's why my apologetic is going to constantly go back there mm. you talk really fast i'm gonna have, <laughs> no. have to slow down I, and, I i i try to slow myself I've down i've got more questions i'm trying to multitask over here <laughs> and like a person talking normal speed i can handle it <laughs> i'll try i'll try to slow it down no you're good i don't want to i don't want to neuter your personality and uh, uh, style i was uh i was on a i, I had a I, I have a podcast on the fight life east network and one time uh someone messaged me because they listened to toby after listening to me and they dialed me back to like 0.75 speed and then toby <laughs> came up next and they thought toby was drunk they're like is it was toby is toby drunk and they're like oh no i'm listening to him at 0.75 speed um and then there, i i did the bible reading challenge with aaron ventura and some of those and someone commented on i think it was on um youtube they said uh i really like these but this guy talks too fast so you're like yeah so win some lose some so yeah <laughs> so i guess the thing that the person told me about how you would gather attention and he might have been talking about somebody else and i got him confused with you okay but he said that the person would would uh like scream like a madman <laughs> to get attention to draw a crowd first yeah. and then immediately like flip a switch yeah, and become no, rational. I, I don't, I don't think, I, well, maybe that's their perception of me. I don't think I, I don't think I ever roll out okay. there and scream like a madman. Save the first 10 minutes. I'm definitely serving up a little more hot cakes. Like, but even like just saying whether you're white, black, like just those words, people like, oh, what? you know what I mean? Like th those are triggering enough that like, you don't have to say anything too, too crazy. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, yeah, I guess that was his perception of you. Yeah. For uh, yeah. Or for worse. Well, I was gonna say, yeah, and yeah, that's, a, that's, that's funny. Cause you, you have a whole spectrum of perceptions. Of it. That's one of the things you can't really control. Like even actually one of the very early on, the first time I ever preached, I was up at UMass Amherst and, um, this was back in 2000 and there was a Jewish kid there named Goodman and there's a hippie looking guy named Brian and they were there for like four hours, same conversation. We finish up and like, I felt like it was a really strong apologetic day. I, I did kind of like, you know, in hindsight, beat up Brian a little bit apologetically and even, and would answer Goodman's questions is like of why Jesus was the Messiah. And, and even that was like a little bit of a different approach. Cause like, you know, doing a little more precept with Brian puts him defensive and just kind of gets him cackled a little bit. Whereas, um, uh, the the goodman guy i'm i'm doing a little more defense like he's asking well what about this first what about this first and so it's a little more so i'm playing a little more defense which kind of makes the nature of the conversation him in control which just kind of changes some of the dynamics but uh at the end of the day goodman comes up to me and goes man this is my favorite day ever on campus thank you so much for coming out here and blah blah blah, blah. and brian comes up to me he's like man you're an effing idiot <laughs> it's like the, the exact same day exact same dialogue exact same discourse uh one thought it was great the other thought i was an idiot and so did you know, he shake your hand because you mind that uh, I yeah. Think you're an idiot. yeah yeah they, they usually will they usually will. and what was <laughs> what the thing that was kind of good was the next day i was getting ready to preach and brian came up to me asked if i could have lunch with him so uh i went and sat with him for an hour and had lunch and just talked a little bit about the gospel a little bit more broadly other things but that's one of the things you get uh comfortable with early on is is that element of like you know you, you perception yeah how do people perceive me you know what i mean you 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 simply aren't really in control of it and yes yeah, two people walk away from the exact same situation one thing you're a total madman the other like i'll often get i feel like i often get like oh wow you're not half as insane as i thought you're gonna be so um yeah so I, I never i've never deliberately started off with the uh my hair is on fire and then uh pivot to to normalcy um but it would but i was and that's the thing that's even funny there's been a handful of times where professors have had me come into classes and teach their philosophy class um and stuff like that because they're just like yeah um make a defense for your faith in here and and it's 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 always so funny to me because it's almost everything I say on campus 
but the students are more controlled. Like they can't be like, what about the gays? You know what I mean? Or are you saying we're all going to hell? Like, and, and so like when you can't just do that and emote behind it and you have to actually have to deal with my arguments in the classroom, I've often left the classroom and the students would be like, man, I like you so much better in here than out there. I was like, actually the difference is actually you guys, you have to be controlled in here. I'm saying everything I'm saying out there, I'm saying in here, the difference is how you guys get to respond to it mm. out there. There's no restraint on you guys in here. There's restraint on you. I'm, the, I'm more or less, obviously I'm more animated publicly speaking in an open forum when there's 150 kids gather around in a classroom, you know, I mean, it's just different environments. So uh, my, my animation's different, but I would say my message and my basic contours of my inflection, everything else is, is largely the same. It's interesting to hear that they, they appreciate the setting of the a controlled setting yeah. a lot more, yeah. at least the ones that are, that want to listen versus the people that obviously they'll engage with you and they don't want to hear what you have to say, but they engage anyway. Mm -hmm. It sounds a lot like social media Yeah, and like, just like, Pull back from those people. Don't engage with them at all because they actually don't want to engage even though they're engaging. So it's like mm -hmm. very counterproductive. Yeah. And you have to – and that's why I have to figure out casting pearls before swine is like – so even early on when I'm preaching, uh, say I'm struggling getting a crowd and some guy who I just know is a time waster, who I just know is pearls before swine, like, all right, keep him around. Maybe he'll get my crowd going. You know what I mean? And then once the crowd comes, then there is definitely a pivot. Okay. Hopefully crowd him out of the conversation. Yeah. And he show, and after a little bit, you just kind of like – talk to the rest of the crowd and like you kind of shut him off and ignore him and so, so like if you can't behave like the other good little <laughs> children then i'm going to turn my back on you yeah and and they get then they get bad um and they might get more animated but within that like uh, it is like an element. Oh, you want to be a fool? So be it. I'm gonna. I will use you to get my crowd. And now that I have my crowd, we're done with you. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I'm not gonna cast pearls before swine. And then and then even when people are asking me questions, um. And, you know, again, it's subjective. So you kind of think they're being sincere. They're not being sincere. And if I don't think they're being sincere, my answer is not for them. It's for the rest of the crowd. And so that's one of the things that people maybe don't realize what you're doing is like everything I'm doing. Like I see these say there's 100 people there and there's like 15 who I think are genuinely listening because like you just it's just a different dynamic. Like 15 are really in 15 who just hate you. And then a bell shape where people don't know where they're and most of what i'm doing is for those people that are like oh they're really paying attention and there are times where i'll just kind of shut the meeting down because i'm like these two or three people are just so genuinely interested hang on everything like i just kind of want to pivot slow everything down and just like share the gospel water what's growing yeah and just how can i do this i remember being in oklahoma a few years ago and a girl really sincere question i remember just i took my chair and i sat down at that point and there's probably 75 kids and about 10 minutes later there was 20 kids but those 20 kids is all sat and but it was largely just me and her interacting and it was just mildly different meeting so you have to be willing to pivot like anyway that, and that's kind of the hard part is like when you ask like you know what do you try to achieve for the day there's a bunch of things you know what i mean i'd love to have 150 people there um or more um but at the same time like if i feel it's it's you know it's for this person that i'm here today like all right let's somehow shape it towards that and and there are, and even th one of the things that's weird you can start preaching and you'll get a crowd. Like I remember a few years ago being at this campus and just thinking like there were probably 200 kids. And I remember just thinking like they could leave at any second. And there are other days where you might have 150, 200 kids. And you're like, I could be quiet for the next 10 minutes. They're not going anywhere. You know? And it's, a, it's like really weird. Like, and I don't know what creates that or, or how to establish that all the time. You just tell like, nope, they're totally glued to everything I'm saying. And there are other times like it's a raucous crowd, but they could all pivot and leave in a second. They're, they're, I just don't have them yet. And uh, yeah, th those are the sort of strange dynamics that like you're trying to feel when you're out there and uh, and act accordingly. Because as, as much as they're responding to me, I'm trying to respond to them as well. So have you ever been arrested twice? Uh, got arrested in 2011 in, um, Ohio. Um, had, I was having a really good meeting. It was kind of funny because, uh, my parents, I grew up in Ohio and my parents, were, um, about 45 minutes from Youngstown and on Thursday it rained. I don't always preach on Fridays, um, just because like I'm often traveling or the school are, are just dead on Fridays, but I woke up. Friday morning, it rained Thursday, I didn't get to preach. So I was just really like, I was like, oh, I need to preach, I need to preach. And it was beautiful out. And I was like, I'm gonna go up to Youngstown, Ohio. I was visiting my parents, my, my mom's like, nothing, don't go to Youngstown, nothing good happens in Youngstown. I was like, oh, I'm just gonna preach on campus, nothing bad can happen. contrarian nature <laughs> in its head again. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I go up to uh, Youngstown, Ohio, start preaching. Really good meeting, actually. Like there's probably, probably not more than 60 kids, um, 
for most of the day, but I thought they were really respectful. They were raised their hands and uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then out of the blue, uh, my back was in his garden. I get a shoulder in my lower back. I just thought I was going to get beat up, but it was a cop. And he came in hot. And as soon as he hit me, my body kind of arcs like you get hit in the lower back. And as soon as I hit, I turn, I can see like clearly he's dressed as a cop. You know what I mean? It's clearly a cop. But then he just kind of went nuts and he was trying to scoop me off my feet and his glasses fell. I remember him stepping on his glasses and breaking his glasses. And it was bizarre. Next time, rear, 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 like six cars pull up and all that sort of stuff. They throw me in the back of a car. They cuff me, throw me in the back of a car. And they accused me of, I think it was disorderly conduct. Because I remember like six months later, it was either disorderly conduct or disturbing the peace. I don't remember. Because I remember about six months later talking to a cop. And he asked me if I've ever been arrested doing it. And I said, yeah, I got arrested. And he's like, what do they charge you with? And I think it was disorderly conduct. He goes, ah, the catch-all, huh? So it's just their dumping bucket. Because it's kind of like we can make the guy go away. It's minimal charges. So even for wrong, it's not like a major catastrophe and you know you have 60 people gather around one guy we can say it's disorderly you know that, that he's disturbing the peace or whatever uh they went with and um that kind of stunk because i ended up pleading no contest because i had to leave the country the next summer and my trial kept getting deferred and then it was over the summer that i was i was going to be in new zealand and they wouldn't let me defer it anymore because my lawyer stunk i went through one of these christian freebies and you get what you pay for and uh, so next thing i know um i was like all right i'll just plead no contest so i do have a misdemeanor i suppose on my record and then the other one uh last september i was preaching down in uh, idaho and uh, uh the school asked us to shut down the meeting they said the crowd's too big and it was huge and they're like would you mind shutting down the meeting because um we can't carry on normal school activities so like okay we'll shut it down but we'll sit in our chairs and interact with people in smaller groups. And they said, no, we want you off campus. And then at that point, I was like, well, then it's not about you not being able to carry on your normal school activities. It's about our message. So I'm going to stay put and uh, continue to preach. So they wrote me a ticket for uh, trespassing. And I said, well, I'm not leaving. Um, I think you guys are in the wrong, not me. Then the police showed up and uh, they said, hey, you have to leave or we will charge you with criminal trespassing. And I said, and there were a handful of people speaking out against me. And I was like, is that person being charged with trespassing? Is that person? And then just said, no, they want you off campus. And I was like, again, that, but I, I was like, that's why I'm protesting this. I was like, because it's, it's about me, not about uh, the atmosphere. You know what I mean? It's about my content. And so then the police, uh, I went to turn and leave. I was packing up at this point. I turned to leave. And uh and as I turned to leave, they said I was resisting an officer um, because I was leaving campus after – because one of them did say we're charging you with criminal trespass. And so that was me leaving the police. So I was charged with obstructing an officer. So I had uh, – so I spent the afternoon in like the Atta County – jail i'm not built for jail i'll tell you that right now <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was in there with my little like my little khaki pants my button down and my little suede shoes or whatever and everybody else was in an orange jumper and uh, slippers and clearly one criminal is not like the other in this context so i was kind of in there like it was supposed to be like they said it oh, only be like 30 minutes but it was like I, I don't know if it was four or five hours it felt like five hours but one guy even attacked another guy while i was in there like just randomly and the guy who gets decked was like why did he attack me? The cops like we don't know. You know what I mean? I was like, is he is someone going to attack me? So head just kind of on a swivel in uh, the little jail cell for the for the afternoon. Did so you try to start up another preaching thing, no. <laughs> singing in jail. No, I thought at first I thought I was going to be there so short, and then the other thing was after that other guy got attacked, I was like, I just kind of want to roll on out of here. You know what I mean? I just keep my head down, don't make eye contact, and uh, get out of here. Probably a wise decision. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, but kind of related to the arrest, um, one of the angles. Uh, that schools have really plugged, uh, at least in the fall, was the, the idea of uh, trespassing. That was kind of their new angle when they come out and oppose me. And so I'm, I'm still uh, with with this current arrest. Uh, it hasn't been settled in court yet, but we're hoping. Yeah, we have a lawyer and we'll, we're challenging it. We've paid for this one. So um, we are challenging it more directly. And hopefully, hopefully, because I, I feel like we do need to set precedent on this idea that like the school can't go this trespass route whereas that has never been an issue before in 10 years of open air preaching schools have never threatened me with trespassing before and then i think it was four or five times through the fall once i got literally got arrested for trespassing and then the uh, i was threatened with trespassing the other time so it's definitely something you want to push back on and kind of you know stop as maybe i think doug wilson says i'm like you know you want to you want to stop at the first crime scene not not 30 crime scenes deep. This is the first crime scene, hopefully pushed back at this point. Do you think that there should be, since it's not really happening as a rule on campuses, I would like to have a place that I could go to have different types of discussions with believers, unbelievers on any type of political conversation of the day. And I don't really have, feel like I have a place to do that. 
college campus would be my first thought, but then still it's like, obviously you're, you're dealing with the environment that a lot of people that also want to discuss don't like the environment of having hecklers come in and all this type of stuff. They want sort of like a, an do you feel like a lot of people would, or is that, is there an organization that does that type of thing or you have, um, uh, something Christus, I cannot think of the name of the group on campus. There's a group that tries to have like a little bit more of an open forum discussion. I don't know how well they go um, because part of the challenge, uh, I, I think it's genuinely difficult to get people from different camps to have a real debate, dialogue sort of thing. And and that's even the reality. Like when I show up on campus, I know you're going to even if you even if you have five people who just hate you, they can make your day really, really difficult. You know what I mean? So uh, all it takes is five. It can really only take one to really be like where I was at in Central Florida a few weeks ago. And there's one guy particularly who just like would not let me talk. And I've been at other campuses where they bring out music and they'll just drown you out with music or they'll just scream so no one can hear you. Um, the, the hard part is genuinely having a broad spectrum of people that really want to debate and interact on topics. I think that's the hardest thing. So I kind of go out there to create it. And even one of the hard parts is you have all these guys who might listen to like Dave Rubin or um, even like a uh, Joe Rogan and stuff like that. And they're kind of like, Oh, we want civil discourse. It's like, well, we're, probably, we're not probably not going to get it. You know what I mean? Like you got to realize like we, we're in, especially if you have an open forum like this, you're not going to have civil discourse. And it would have to be a paid service where you weed out the people who are serious and who aren't. Yeah. Yeah. Type of thing. And, and that's where I have to like uh, size things up and like, here's this guy who's just hooting and hollering about this and being like, okay, this is for everybody else. They're going to be quiet, but they're still listening. So, so that's where like, I just go, I create the environment that I want, try to create the environment I want and interact on the issues I want. Like, and that's the thing, like, n like, as long as I have the first amendment in a way, like I get to dictate everything that goes on there. So there's a, even a period where I thought, oh man, I'd love to be a professor at a secular university. I was like, why would I, I have... I have a hundred kids listen to me every day for five hours on the gospel on what I want to talk about. And so, and so, yeah, I just kind of go create it. And that, that's the thing. So the hard part is getting it more contained. You know what I mean? Cause I know part of it is, and part of what I love about it is guys who will never step foot in a church or in a Christian ministry is like, Hey, let's go get the racist, sexist, homophobe. You know what I mean? Cause without even knowing me, they are dead sure I'm a racist, sexist, homophobe. So let's go get them. Next thing you know, they spent three hours or even if it's an hour interacting with me and then they kind of like me, you know what I mean? Uh, and not, I don't want to paint a rose picture. Plenty of times where they still hate me. I still get hate mail. You know what I mean? I leave campus. I get a few emails or like why they hate me or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, so that, I think that is the hard part. I think people, Going back to my first comment about evangelism, people want, I think people do want to have discussions. I don't think people know how to have discussions. Uh, I don't think people know how to disagree. Uh, I'm not saying I know how to do it well. I mean, I, I create environments where people write newspaper articles about a bad guy coming to town. You know what I mean? So, so it's not your, it's not a, a Dave Rubin interview sort of thing that I'm doing. Um, so yeah, you have to, you have to be very intentional and seek it out with people. And then from there, the hard part is like, you know, even I think people being prepped on what the topic is, finding people who mm. like know the topic well enough to like, yeah, I want to go to a discussion on this. Well, hopefully in a, in a, in a particular area, like let's say a city, you, you've plowed that field enough that people have grown up with it over time and they know the deal. And I mean, you might still get newbie questions, but it'll be a single guy out of, you know, 5,000 who doesn't know how things work instead of everybody. <laughs> Yeah, and because even last time I went to it, uh, they had uh, a guy who gave like a kind of like a biblical chronology discussion on uh, the mountain for Noah's Ark and all that sort of stuff, and and like I, I, you know I know the biblical narrative fairly well, but I don't know uh, you know Middle Eastern geography well enough to be like oh yeah here's the headwater you know what I mean, and so so like me listening to him was a relatively passive event. He opened up to the questions at the end, but it was like there was maybe one decent question, and everyone else was like kind of at a loss. So depending on like where you're at on the level. So I do think that is one of the hard things is, is getting that discussion going. I think Moscow is a little bit of a unique place where you have a, a pretty good air of people who've been exposed to a lot. But even, even here, I, I feel like I have a pretty core group of guys I can meet with and discuss things uh, with. But um, I mean, it's nothing like campus I, I, where I, I just get to discuss whatever I, I want and, and people are there like, and I have a crowd that people want to interact with me. So I, I feel like I, I feel like I have a great job from that standpoint. And it is like, yeah, I gotta I gotta discuss Jesus all day long with a bunch of people who either know absolutely nothing about him. And then probably even one of my favorite things is I had a slow day at Ole Miss the other day, but these young Christian guys were just asking me questions about Reformed theology and stuff like that. And so uh, sitting there and talking to guys who have never been exposed to covenant theology and going through the Bible, here's why we believe covenant theology or Presbyterianism. Um, I mean, even even that, even on a slow day, you still have uh, like I gotta talk about covenant theology to a bunch of guys that 
have never heard of it before. You know I mean? They just they just knew they're supposed to love Jesus and da da da. So even on slow days, I find that like yeah, what I get to do. So yeah, I can see why people want it. I think it is difficult to find uh, yeah, kind of open, genuine open forums and real genuine dialogue that can take place. It's pretty hard. I know you get all kinds of different types that you've seen, either a new believer coming to faith or a, a more mature believer being opened up to a new something deeper that's true that he felt like he was missing and he found you you helped him find it. Given all that, is there like a particular response that you have that's a favorite, like when you help somebody get from point A to point B? Yeah, like, and I think my, yeah, when the light bulb, when the light bulb goes on, like uh, I always share the story. There, there are actually two stories that like, I feel like sum it up. I was going back to the resurrection aspect i was preaching in southern california um and a girl asked me she she had had like a little bit of a christian background she just asked really like kind of pointed questions about the bible and justice and this and that and then she's like all right well what about the soul talk about the soul of man and i was like well i think man ha has a soul um and i was like but uh, i think the emphasis in the bible is not the immortality of the soul but the resurrection of the body i was like so as a christian i'm not looking for the immortality of the soul as if my soul is going to escape this body and live in worlds unknown um but i believe there is a separation at death but what i look forward to actually is at the end of history the resurrection of the body and she just goes oh that's why the tomb was empty he rose from the dead he rose from the dead and and for that light bulb to go on it was like amazing it really was like she and she could start preaching at that point yeah, yeah she essentially could and what was funny she's like oh my gosh because all day you've been saying jesus lord and if he rose from the dead of course he would be Lord. And if he's Lord, well, of course you'd obey him. You know what I mean? And it was like all these pieces came together for her. But that, oh, that's why the tomb was empty was an amazing thing for me. And then uh, one other time at um, George Mason in D.C., uh, there, I mean, the whole campus hated me because there's like 12 Saudi nationals that were ready to kill me for being a polytheist. And if I was in Saudi Arabia, I would not be here today. And, uh, and they're all yelling at me. But on a college campus, everybody's going to are willing to ignore their... Uh, you know, death to the de death to the apostate infidel and his you know their theocratic elements going on in their the uh, their their social order. Um, all they know is there's a white guy with the Bible, so he must be racist, and he's clearly Islamophobic and blah blah. blah. And so the whole place has worked up with me, and I was just standing my ground preaching. And I remember a girl in the front listening to me, and uh, as we're going back and forth, and the the Muslim said something like, "Nobody here likes you. Why don't you get off campus?" And I go, "The Christian girl likes me," and she just leans forward, and goes, "I'm Jewish," and I was <laughs> like, "Well, the Jewish girl likes me," and. Uh, and the thing I was pretty amazed about today, I literally preached like 9.45 that day from like noon to 9.45. And the only reason I stopped is I had to go to the bathroom. Like, And even that day, kind of wild, like a guy came through, he had like a forklift of water and he just drops off 24 bottles of water. And I drank, drank like 18 of them. But so like by 9.45, I was, my, I was in so much pain. I, I was bun like bent over because I was like my bladder. I was like from about six o'clock, I just kept holding. I was like, oh my goodness, I got to go. And so finally I quit. But then I came back out and interacted with him. And she and I kept in touch until about a year and a half, two years ago. She got married. And so we, uh, but um uh, but what was interesting, even within that, she had a tough time because of the whole baptism. Like, she's like, the Jews will eject me. The Jews will eject me. And so she was really wrestling through uh, the faith and that component. But that's usually, like, the immediate, like, transition. And that girl even told me, she's like, I came out of class, and I felt like God said, go listen to that man speak. And I was like, man, the crowd was so chaotic. She goes, didn't matter. I knew you were telling the truth. I knew everybody else was lying. She's like, I, I knew that watching. So when you have that epiphany moment, the other thing I actually really enjoy are, are the person who comes out huffy puffy and after listening for a while they're kind of like settled in and kind of like they might shake my hand or hey or write me a note like hey when i got out here i i hated you and blah blah, blah and but after listening to you for a while this that, and the other so those are probably my two favorite uh things that take place on campus when you have you don't have that uh, radical epiphany tons like the aha moment um at least not immediately you just got them one step further yeah most of it's that subtle like huh, I've never thought about that before. Um, and I, like, especially with believers and that's, that's what I'll take. Um, so yeah, my favorites, the aha. Then the second one is definitely the person who shows up rolling their eyes, can't stand me, but then they listen for a little while and they might shake my hand when they come out. I, I think of a girl, particularly I was at Cal state river or UC Riverside. And I remember this girl coming out and just you know, was beside herself with how awful I was, you know what I mean? And uh, like everything I would say, but then I don't know. I don't remember what the, I don't remember what the question was. But I remember her asking a question. I started answering her question, and then her whole disposition changed. She was there for another hour, and she comes over, shakes my hand, and then she left. And so that's was, that's probably my probably my favorite is just like okay, they they went from thinking I'm a monster to like okay, the gospel's at least like 
normal in a way. You know what I mean? And he's the guy's not just a jerk out here, like throwing haymakers and trying to get everything riled up. So. What is uh, Whitfield Fellowship? Yeah, so Whitfield Fellowship's an organization. I started with some other guys back in 2009. So I was living in New York City. I had a job in New York, and I went to seminary prior to moving to New York and working in finance. Um, but around 2009, you know, I had a handful of people like, hey, you're wasting your life in finance. Go preach the gospel. And I wanted to go preach that. So internally, I wanted to do it. And then externally, people started saying, hey, you're wasting your life. Go preach the gospel. And then there's some guys planning a church in Ohio who asked if I'd be interested in um, pastoring. And I say, I don't think I'm called to be a pastor. Like, well, we think you should be doing ministry. And so why don't you come under us and preach on campus? And so Whitfield Fellowship was birthed out of that. So George Whitfield was part of the first Great Awakening, preaching through the American colonies. So that's kind of where Whitfield's name came from. And then, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so that's kind of what it is. And I've been up here in Moscow. Uh, the idea would be under a church, uh, more immediately that church ended up falling apart, I think in 2015. So I've been a little autonomous since that's even part of, I, I worked for Trinity Reform Church in 1819 and then um, back up here now for blah, blah, blah. So the ideal is to be under a church with elders and sent out in that way. Um, and the challenge is, yeah, you know, this type of ministry is generally, uh, seems to be dominant by like uh, independent Baptists um, or like Pentecostals, you know what I mean? Some, some, something along those lines are very like house church oriented sort of people. Um, whereas Presbyterians are not as keen on it. They're a little more, uh, you know, whatever. I, I, I always joke that we're kind of like overly educated white people, generally speaking, like my, my background in Presbyterian circles. And so, you know, this is where it is. Like it's a little bit more blue collar, like UFC fighting. You know what I mean? It's not as like, erudite. It's, it's not Tim Keller, not to put Tim Keller down, but it's not Tim Keller. You know what I mean? It's not going to New York and, you know, reading the New York times or the New Yorker and giving uh, a pseudo intellectual presentation. It's, it's, uh, hopefully I'm, engaged in the intellectual stuff but it's you know it's a street fight more than it is like you know buying a cup of coffee for somebody mm -hmm. and presbyterians are better at buying a cup of coffee for somebody so yeah friendship evangelism is more the and that's fine I, i'm not putting any if however you want to share the gospel i'm not putting anybody down but the culture of presbyterianism is not as much street fighting as it is there's nothing more engaging than watching somebody talk to your face in public. <laughs> like that's the frequency God designed us to interact at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and especially, and that was even the thing that's kind of interesting that like so many people lost it. The fall was just so out of control because for two years, year and a half, people weren't having that interaction at all. You know what I mean? It was, it was like, they've been so dehumanized that when I show up on campus, like I'm getting all of their ire from the previous year and a half of their anxiety, sure. fears and everything else. You know what I mean? And, and if you can paint me as being the, the demon in the system, if it wasn't for this guy, everything would be going well. You know what I mean? So, um, and yeah, I was receiving everybody's ire, but I think that's even one of the pivots this semester. People have been out a little bit more. And I feel like so far people have been, it's been so much more fruitful. People have been kinder. People are a bit more open. And so they're starting to appreciate that human interaction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It says, yeah, it took a little bit to get there. And so hopefully, uh, there'll be a sign of the rest of the semester. So cool. If somebody's interested in this or their gut reaction is that they want to run up far away, as far away from this as possible, <laughs> Um, maybe hook them in somehow anyway. Yeah, I would say, well, you can go to YouTube, Keith Darrell YouTube. You can see a couple of videos there of me preaching, uh, mainly in New York City. Uh, had a really fun time in 2016 uh, with some guys preaching in New York City. It was a real blast. Every night in the park was like, I felt like a big crowd and people genuinely interested. And it's one of those things, if I was a little more organized, because so many people would come up like, do you preach at a church here? I want to come to your church. I was like, I just preach out here. And that was a great time. But there were some videos from that summer uh, there, two particularly, one with a... I can't remember her name, uh, something Silverman, S Winter Silverman, maybe. Uh, there was some American atheist guy, something Silverman. I didn't know who he was. The people I was with knew who he was, but it was his daughter who was raising objections. So that's one of the videos um, that you could maybe get a flavor of. And then there's a couple other if you click around there. So Keith Darrell on YouTube, uh, campuspreacher.com. If you want to like contact me, if you have any questions for me and stuff like that, or get like my newsletter or support the support the cause. We could use support for the cause. The, hopefully the next phase is to buy a house here in Moscow. Um, that would be something like Labrie-ish. If you know who Francis Schaefer is and Labrie, he was basically, um, I, I think we have a unique situation here in Moscow. And part of the reason of coming up here is I feel like I have resources that if I bought a house here, start inviting people in to be discipled that I meet on campus, even if they come for a weekend, come for a week, come over Christmas, come over their summer, spend a week or two or three weeks and just kind of help establish people in the faith, uh, people coming into the faith, 
um, people who are already in the faith. And even within that, like one of the people I probably interact with the most, and you know, there's a bunch of caveats you need to put here, but tons of transgender people, like at the end of the day, like they're willing to interact. And nine out of 10 times, you kind of like, man, if they like, yeah, there's 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 so much screwed up here. You know what I mean? Like, how do you, and you know, how do you decouple all this sort of stuff? So try to find a place where people come, ask questions, and be in a Christian community. Like, there's more of the Christian life than me hoot and hollering on a campus. You can come eat. Yeah, this is the George Buchanan Forum. I think that was the one that you mentioned about Noah's Ark. Was that? Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, there was George Buchanan Forum. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, and so that's uh, yeah, so that uh, a Monday lecture. I don't, not sure how many weeks they're going, but um, it's part of that. So yeah, you just have resources here. You have people with wisdom. Um, so anyway, so you can go to campuspreacher.com to learn more about that. I think I'm campus evangel on Twitter and then campus preacher on Instagram and then Keith Daryl on Facebook. And so if you, uh, yeah, if you Facebook me, if you're, uh, I'll probably friend you if, if we have some friends in common. What is your podcast on the fight, laugh, feast network? Yes. So campus preacher on the fight, laugh, feast network. So if you punch in Keith Daryl or more directly campus preacher, my podcast should come up on any of those search engines. I try to do one once a week. They're usually, uh, I shoot for 15 minutes, but they probably usually go 25 minutes. So uh, yeah, so if you get the Fight, Laugh, Feast app, um, everything, all their content's free that I'm aware of on that. They might have some stuff, subscriber stuff that's hidden, but as far as all the podcasts, all sort of jazz, it's free. Very good. Thanks for thanks yeah. for agreeing to come. I'm glad yeah. I caught you on a good week. Yeah, I'm I'm back in town for a week. I'll probably fly to Arizona. Is what I'm looking at for next week. So if you're in Arizona, I'm not sure when this will air. Um, if uh, you, yeah, if you're in Arizona, next month, probably okay, beginning of March. Okay, yeah. So in March, I'll probably largely be up here. I might be through the Rocky Mountains. So if it, um, yeah. So so feel free to reach out to me. See if I'm anywhere near you. If you want to meet up, come to campus with me. Uh, get an idea of what's going on. We can uh, you can come out and join me. You know, I might run a little background check on you because guys one of the things that uh, I was actually a jerk to a guy a few weeks ago, I was preaching down in Florida and a guy comes up to me. He's like, Hey, can I join you? And he had like, he had like a, he was pulling like a dolly with, he had signs and some other things. And I was like, I don't know you. And, uh, and da 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 da. Cause like, it is like, I, I, it is like when I, I do think like, I feel like eight out of 10 preachers I meet on campus, like they're a little bit of an odd ball. You know what I mean? And so, so when they just walk up, like, can I join you? And you, I don't know their theology. I don't, they're going to say, I don't know. I was like, no, you can't just join me. So, uh, you know, I may not it, give you the reins to preach, but, uh, and I might try to figure out like, you know, are you, you basically healthy church or whatever, that sort of thing. But yeah, if you're, um, want to come out, meet me, meet me for a meal, whatever it is, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much.